Great. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar on the legal, financial, and efficacy implications of policies and practices that serve to criminalize homelessness. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Maria Foscarinas, and I am Executive Director of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. The Law Center is the only national organization dedicated to using the power of the law to end and prevent homelessness in the United States. We're very pleased to be part of the White House um, Data-Driven Justice Initiative. And within that initiative, the Law Center's focus is on helping communities address homelessness constructively, avoiding criminal justice responses that are typically ineffective, costly, and that can raise constitutional concerns. Our goal is to prevent homeless people from entering the criminal justice system to begin with. So this webinar is um, intended to help in that effort, and it's the first of a series. And we're very pleased to be collaborating and coordinating with the Corporation for Supportive Housing in this series. Um, we will each be presenting different webinars within our areas of expertise, and we're coordinating um, those presentations with each other. CS H focuses on helping communities develop permanent supportive housing, and the Law Center um, will focus on the legal and policy tools um, that communities need and can use to promote housing solutions and to avoid criminalization. So we're very grateful for the partnership of the White House and the and of um, the National Association of Counties on this initiative. And I'd like to introduce Kelly Jin and Natalie Ortiz to offer a few of their own words of welcome. Um, so Kelly serves as policy advisor to the US Chief Technology Officer and Chief Data Scientist at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Woo, that is even longer than our name. In her current role, Kelly supports the implementation of the White House Data-Driven Justice Initiative with a focus on expanding criminal justice and policing initiatives to more communities to build scalable technology products and tools. Um, and she will, in just a moment, say a few words of welcome. Um, and as will Natalie Ortiz, who is the Senior Policy Analyst at the National Association of Counties. She has a PhD in criminology and criminal justice from Arizona State University. And she most recently co-authored a report for the National Institute of Justice that discussed the findings of a three-year study examining the effect of a criminal record on employment. And um, she has also co-authored several evaluations and reports for the California Department of Corrections, California Department of Justice, and California Office of Emergency Services. So um, with those introductions, Kelly, if you would like to go first and just offer a few words of welcome, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it is very, very exciting to, to be on the line and, and speaking with all of you. And uh, yes, I do have a, a both a very long title and a very long um, office name as well, but it's really exciting to call in from the White House and really wanted to offer some remarks and, and first off to say thank you to everyone for their work and thank you also to the Law Center for uh, providing um, resources and, and assistance to this broader community. Um, for those of you who are familiar or are not familiar, the Data Driven Justice Initiative was launched only this past June, so June 2016, and we launched with 67 jurisdictions. We are now up to over double that. So uh, it has been both this amazing um, momentum had by all of our jurisdictions as well as additional states, counties, and cities that are really starting to see the, the results and the impact of connecting across different jurisdictions. Um, and really, I, I, I wanted to say in, in my remarks that all of this work has been sparked over the past year of answering this question of how do we serve a lot of the individuals that cycle through our systems. So when we talk about law enforcement, uh, jail, housing, 
mental health, hospital systems. These are all very disparate systems, oftentimes very disparate organizations as well. And so um, a lot of times people will ask, you know, what is, what is the data and technology piece? And, and so for us, myself, sitting within our Office of Science and Technology Policy, a lot of this work is not only how do we connect people across organizations, but oftentimes how do we connect all of these data systems and technology systems to actually talk to one another. Um, and we know through the data that the vast majority of individuals that are cycling through these systems are, um, low-level offenders and, and really are not getting the help that they need from uh, the government service that they're receiving today. So uh, whether that is uh, Bear County, Texas, or, or Miami-Dade, Florida, we have some really, really great examples that we've been lifting up and something that Megan Smith, our Chief Technology Officer, always says is how do we scout and scale? How do we connect what is really being built out in different communities and connecting them to one another so that you can learn from one another? So that is enough talking from me. I will uh, say that I'm just really excited to have the Law Center be both a part of the Data Driven Justice Initiative as well as just the broader conversation um, and know that through this webinar um, and, and through their involvement, they're really facilitating this larger dialogue on how do we improve justice uh, and, and community relations um, all across our country at all different levels, federal, state, and, and local. Um, and so I will now turn it over to Natalie Ortiz, who is uh, another member of the Data Driven Justice uh, community and team. Uh, National Association of Counties has a huge involvement in the work that we're doing and a lot of the work that we're going to be doing past January as well. There's a, a definite sustainability plan there. Um, but thank you guys. Thank you for hopping onto the webinar and uh, I will turn it over to Natalie now. Well, thank you, Kelly and Maria, for that introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm Natalie Ortiz. I am with the National Association of Counties. We are based in Washington, D.C., and we represent county governments. There are 3,069 county governments in the United States, and we support and advocate their work to really advance public policy that will improve county systems, including the justice system, the health system, human services system, when we talk about you know, connecting systems and, and data sharing and data integration, we really view the county as having a key role in that. So here at NACO, we're happy to offer our support of the Law Center's efforts. Uh, don't let their legal background intimidate you because they're here to share their expertise and advance best practices that is going to support the work uh, of your DDJ strategy in your community. So much like Kelly, I share great excitement and enthusiasm to be a part of this initiative, to, and NACO as well for being part of this initiative, and we're really looking forward to carrying on this partnership with the White House, but then also sustaining it into 2017 and beyond. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to share in the partnership, and um, I expect a, a great and helpful webinar today. Wonderful. Thank you both, Kelly and Natalie for those um, remarks and really, really helpful. And we at the Law Center are so excited to be working with you as well and to be part of this. Um, now I'd like to introduce our um, main panelists, Eric Tars and Tristia Bauman. Both Eric and Tristia are senior attorneys at the Law Center. They're both experts on the legal and policy issues that we'll be discussing today. And in addition to their deep substantive expertise, they both have much practical experience with the issues. Among their many duties, they respond to many technical assistance requests on these issues from communities across the country, um, requests from both advocates and from cities um, as well, and counties from local government as well. And between them, they have advised literally hundreds of communities, and that may be an underestimate. Um, they both have distinguished academic and career backgrounds. I invite you to see their bios on our website. We're lucky to have them at the Law Center and on this webinar. So 
so without further ado, I will turn it over first to Eric. Great. Thank you so much, Maria, um, and uh, Kelly and Natalie as well. Uh, so uh, as the, uh, <coughs> uh, the title of the webinar uh, relates, we are going to look at uh, the legal implications, financial implications, and efficacy implications of the, the criminalization of homelessness today. Um, with a little bit of background and, and basics, um, we know that uh, within the data-driven justice initiative, you know, we're looking at um, the individuals who are utilizing justice systems and uh, hospital systems to a high degree, um, often with mental health issues or drug dependency issues, and, and these are populations that are often but not necessarily always overlapping with uh, homeless population, so uh, we're hoping to turn the attention today squarely onto the homelessness issue and really emphasize that in addition to, uh, you know, looking at the data solutions, looking how we can share data, um, how we can target some programs that we are going to be able to talk about the legal and policy issues as well. Um, and so we'll, uh, this is kind of the introductory uh, uh, basics of uh, of our webinar series with a little flavor of everything, um, but we will go into much more depth uh, as the series continues. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up today with a little bit of question and answers at the end. So um, people will have the opportunity to do that. And the way that you do that, um, there's two ways. One is you can type questions into your chat box on the side um, or you know, the little red box on your screen, or you, where the red circle is, you can raise your hand um, we won't do the, the hand raising until the end um, of the, the presentation, um, but you can type your questions in at any point and we can either try to answer them as we go along or we'll, we'll answer them at the end. So feel free to do that as you, uh, at any point during the, the presentation. Uh, and just a note that today's presentation is uh, being recorded and so we might be posting it uh, as a DDJI resource um, so just to be aware of that. Um, so with that, I'd like to start off uh, with a poll quickly um, and find out kind of where we are as uh, in our communities. Um, you know, when the public conversations are happening uh, in your community, uh, what is, you know, not necessarily within uh, your community, uh, your very uh, local and aware community that is, is fully supportive of the, your involvement in the DDJI, but within your broader community, uh, kind of what voices are the, the loudest in that conversation? Um, so here we go. Our uh, proposals that would target different aspects of homelessness, uh, per, homeless person's behavior, uh, more likely, equally likely, or less likely as the uh, those that are addressing the underlying causes of that behavior, such as, um, you know, providing housing instead of uh, a criminalizing uh, aspects of homelessness. All right, so we'll give people one more minute and one a couple more seconds all right we've got about 70 percent of people responding so we'll wrap this up and it looks like um, looks like there are uh, more communities that are uh, proposing uh, prohibitions, um, or at least equally, uh, prohibitions and addressing the underlying causes. So that's obviously where we want to get involved and help to change the conversation. And hopefully uh, today you'll learn some things um, and pick up some talking points that can help to shift that conversation in the direction of solutions. So with that, I'm going to um, now turn over to our other attorney, Tristia Bauman, uh, to start uh, taking us through some of the background. Tristia? Is 
Sorry, Tristia, we can't hear you. Hold on, I'm unmuting you. All right, Tristia, Excellent. can you? Can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, well, that was useful to see how many communities are addressing the root causes of homelessness. And so to start this conversation, I think uh, it makes sense to just do a brief overview of what those root causes are. Um, what we know is that a lack of access to affordable housing causes homelessness, and that's the primary driver of homelessness. And there are a number of data sources that have clearly established that. Uh, I I won't go into detail about the uh, various bullet points that we have here, but in addition to rising rents that have been steadily rising uh, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis where vacancy rates are low and there's additional competition for fewer and fewer units, you also have barriers to accessing affordable housing that does exist. Again, uh, an example would be in the wake of the foreclosure crisis, people uh, who had been renting in apartments that were foreclosed upon may have evictions on their records uh, that that were unfairly filed against them, but that now prevent them from being able to compete in the private market and obtain an affordable housing unit. And what that has done is contribute to a rising visible homelessness at the city level. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, root causes that um, cities are suffering um, from and entire communities are suffering from at the city level is the uh, shrinking support provided by the federal government for housing assistance, needed housing assistance. Currently only one in four eligible families receives the housing assistance that they need. In many cities, uh, as you all know, the waiting lists can be extremely long and in fact it can take years before someone can get into to uh, a subsidized unit. And this graph shows the shrinking uh, federal budgets over time and what that has done is really left the uh, ball in the court of the cities to address now a population that is not able to compete in the private market, does not have access to the social safety net that they would need to prevent homelessness and are now forced into public spaces. Next slide please. <laughs> So why are they forced into public spaces? Aren't there enough shelter beds? Well, the answer to that is no. In a number of uh, communities across the country, uh, and this is data that's collected by local continuums of care, what has been established is that there is a very high utilization rate of existing uh, resources. In fact, it's near 100% nationally, and in some cities that expand during inclement weather periods, it is over 100% of capacity. And and in the mayor's, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors report, they described having to turn away people who would uh, attempt to gain access even to single night shelters. Uh, the system is overwhelmed and you see uh, significant gaps. Uh, looking at um, Northwest North Carolina to Albuquerque, New Mexico, here we have a chart showing what those relative gaps are. So for anyone who's unable to access a shelter bed either because the number of human beings is greater than the number of total shelter beds or unable to access a shelter bed because there are practical barriers that make that bed unavailable to them. Uh, for example, uh, limitations on the total number of nights someone can stay in a particular shelter uh, in a given month, or limitations on population served. For example, a shelter may serve only single adult males and therefore not accept uh, the family fleeing domestic violence that includes young children. Uh, and that means that the only option is public space. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, in response to this growing visible homelessness in public space, too many cities have turned to their law enforcement resources to address the problem as a criminal justice issue, uh, treating the life-sustaining conduct that's performed in those public places as crimes or civil infractions when at their heart they are a uh, social issue. Um, they are symptoms of a social issue. 
and namely the lack of access to affordable housing. So one of the things that the Law Center has done is over the course of 10 years track a core set of nearly 200 cities across the country, both urban and rural, large and small, and looked at the laws that are on their books that criminalize homelessness. And when we refer to the criminalization of homelessness, we refer to criminal ordinances as well as ordinances that provide for civil infraction uh, punishment like tickets and fines, as well as practices that displace people from public space when they have no alternatives. And uh, one of the most talked about examples currently of that type of practice is the practice of homeless uh, encampment evictions or homeless sweeps. I won't go through too much uh, detail as it relates to the various categories of conduct, but one of the things that we have found over time through the collection of this data is that cities often do not realize what laws they have that result in the criminalization of homelessness. Whereas they may look narrowly at a law targeting vagrancy, for example, uh, they are overlooking how a, an anti-camping ban that could be written broadly to include merely sleeping outside could also be effectively criminalizing homelessness by punishing the unavoidable conduct um, that every homeless human being forced into public spaces must perform every day, uh, like sleep or sit down or store needed belongings. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, there are a number of different categories that we have been tracking just to help show the broad scope of laws that can capture people in the criminal justice system or saddle them with fines that they're not able to pay, which may later result in their participation in the criminal justice system, and which certainly does entrench their homelessness. Uh, and as you can see, the prevalence of these laws is very high. The Law Center will be releasing an updated report report uh, on the relative increase of these laws over a 10-year span, but the data you're seeing here uh, is current as of 2014, uh, where significant numbers of cities, in fact over half um, of cities in some instances, are making uh, the life-sustaining conduct of homeless people punishable um, without any result. So the question is, and next slide please, does this strategy work? And what we've seen over time is no, this strategy does not work. Uh, jaywalking laws, littering laws, turnstile jumping and swiping laws, while all of them can be justified uh, in a vacuum, what they do not do is address the underlying causes of homelessness and therefore they do not end homelessness. Instead, uh, they hide homelessness by uh, temporarily hiding it um, from public view, either by cycling people through the criminal justice system um, or by uh, incentivizing them to hide in areas where they cannot be spotted, um, which can be dangerous for everyone and which does not address certainly the uh, crisis experienced by homeless people, but also does not address any of the public health, public safety, uh, or public resource issues that uh, communities who are attempting to address visible homelessness struggle with. Um, we will have another webinar that will go into more detail about the expense of enforcing these laws, um, but what our research has shown and what uh, others have shown is that housing is the much more effective, much cheaper option um, as compared with criminalizing homelessness. And the implementation and enforcement of these criminalization laws is harming communities um, by diverting precious limited resources toward a, a solution that is not a solution, something that does not work. Uh, next slide, please. There are also other reasons why cities who engage in a criminalization approach um, are harming themselves in the long run. And one of the things that we've seen, uh, in addition to laws on the books that punish criminal behavior, is we uh, have been tracking lawsuits uh, challenging the violation of homeless persons' rights pursuant to these laws. And what we have found um, in our last review period, and again, we'll be updating it, um, so we'll have current data 
shortly, but between 2011 and 2014, uh, there were a number of cases filed um, that challenged, and here are a couple of examples, food sharing bans, camping and sleeping, and public laws, and restrictions on begging and soliciting um, immediate donations. And what we found is that the overwhelming majority of the cases that were filed in uh, challenging the enforcement practices of cities resulted in some positive outcome to the homeless plaintiffs. Either something that would allow the case to continue on, which of course carries an expense to a city who has to continue defending a, uh, a bad practice, or uh, resulting in settlement agreements that uh, have in some cities amounted to millions of dollars over time. And you can see here the rate of success uh, that we measured last time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, talking just briefly about uh, a current trend, there was a Supreme Court decision that clarified the appropriate legal standard for evaluating restrictions on speech um, that came down in 2015. The Law Center, along with Latham and Watkins, uh, one of our important pro bono partners, and local counsel, uh, applied the Reed decision and set a precedent for challenging panhandling bans using the standard set forth by the Supreme Court under Reed. And what that means is that a lot of the panhandling bans as written um, are arguably unconstitutional under uh, Supreme Court precedent. And what we're finding is that uh, lawsuits that have challenged panhandling bans in the wake of the Reed decision and the uh, Springfield decision that the Law Center worked on um, have resulted in those panhandling bans being struck down as unconstitutional. That's been true in Massachusetts, Maine, Colorado, uh, Illinois, and other states. Uh, and the trend to challenge those laws is likely to continue. Also, there has been an uptick. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> in the filing of lawsuits challenging uh, the criminalization of sleeping or camping outside when there are no lawful alternatives. Uh, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest brief in one of the law center's cases challenging an anti-camping ban in the city of Boise where there are fewer shelter beds than homeless people who need them and the federal government uh, stated that to punish someone for sleeping outside when they have no lawful alternatives amounts to punishing that person's status as a homeless person because they cannot avoid sleeping outside in public space in violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, there's a lot more that we can discuss in the future on those legal points, but I will just note that in the wake of the filing of the DOJ Statement of Interest Brief, a number of legal challenges, particularly on the West Coast, have been filed um, and argued successfully, either striking down a camping ban or uh, resulting again in expensive settlement agreements for cities. Next slide, please. And uh, at this point, I will turn it over to Eric Tars, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Great. Thanks so much, Tristia. Um, so just continuing along on the, the legal implications, um, uh, in addition to all these domestic uh, decisions, even at the international level, the U.S. is receiving massive international critique uh, from numerous international human rights experts and treaty monitoring bodies. Uh, specifically addressing the criminalization of homelessness as cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, just a one step below torture at the international level, um, but in language that's very similar and parallel to our own Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual standard. Um, and so uh, many of the uh, actions taken by federal agencies that I'm going to talk about shortly, um, as well as uh, some of these court decisions, are being influenced uh, um, by this international trend as well. Uh, so, in sum, when resources for fighting homelessness are scarce, it seems foolish to spend them on losing court battles or losing in the court of international public opinion, 
when they could be much better spent on actually ending homelessness. Um, and so because of the dubious legal nature of these laws and the pressure from sources both domestic and international, the federal government has been taking an increasingly strong stance against the criminalization of homelessness. Uh, the government's actions provide officials who want to stop criminalization and promote more constructive alternatives at the local level with very important tools to use to reframe the public dialogue. This started back in 2012 with a report uh, from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness um, that was actually mandated by Congress um, in the 2009 Hearth Act, um, where they discussed the criminalization of homelessness, um, the fact that it is uh, unconstitutional and against our human rights obligations, and um, provided some useful examples of uh, constructive alternatives. Following that report, uh, as Tristia just mentioned, in uh, August of 2015, the Justice Department filed their brief in our case, Bell v. Boise, um, arguing that the criminalization of homelessness of sleeping um, is unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment and garnering a huge amount of uh, press attention, including an editorial in the Washington Post and in many uh, local papers as, as people were worried that uh, the Justice Department might be looking at their laws next. Um, the, in terms of using this as a tool, uh, we know from, uh, for example, in Portland, um, Oregon, the, the mayor and his chief of staff were actually going to community um, leaders uh, in the different neighborhood associations who were fighting their efforts to try to provide housing or, or shelter services in their neighborhoods um, and saying, you know, we don't want that problem here, kind of the not in our backyard issue. Um, they were able to use this threat of uh, Justice Department intervention uh, to help bring those individuals to the table and say, you know, none of us are, might be happy about having to do something, but if we don't do something, then, you know, we might be facing a lawsuit from the federal government, so we, we might as well come together and try and do something constructively together. And they found that was a, an, a useful tool for them um, to be able to, to bring them to the table. Uh, in addition to uh, filing the lawsuit, the, the Justice Department, through their Community-Oriented Policing Services Division, or COPS Division, uh, dedicated an entire uh, newsletter, uh, one of their electronic newsletters that goes out to over 6,000 of their uh, law enforcement colleagues uh, to the criminalization of homelessness and to constructive alternatives, really talking about why police don't need to be uh, playing a role or playing the role that they are playing in homelessness, uh, in, in addressing homelessness in their communities. Uh, then the, the next thing that we saw was uh, the, um, noted, uh, the funding application for continuums of care in uh, various communities that deal with uh, providing services to homeless communities. Um, for the first time, they put a question in their funding application saying, uh, asking what those continuums are doing to end the criminalization of homelessness in their communities. And again, this is a, a great tool uh, to uh, help encourage communities and say, look, not only does this cost us, uh, you know, money in the abstract, but there's very concrete federal dollars uh, that we may be losing because we aren't taking steps against the criminalization of homelessness. Uh, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness also uh, put out a report in August of 2015 on ending homelessness for people living in encampments, um, providing a, a very nice checklist of steps that communities can take uh, that provide a, a positive route out of the encampments that many communities are experiencing right now rather than one that's focused on simply sweeping that uh, community out without, uh, without providing alternatives. Um, so it's a great tool uh, to help prompt a conversation about what another approach might look like and what a, what a better approach might look like um, and, and the steps that need to go into that. Um, this uh, guidance has been put into law already in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, one of the communities that's going to be joining us on our next webinar um, uh, to talk about that, uh, where they have actually passed an ordinance saying that we will not evict an encampment unless we are able to provide alternative adequate housing for the people who are living in it. 
Um, and that's a, a great step forward and, uh, you know, consistent with the guidance um, and really helps to make sure that uh, the community is kind of putting its policies where its mouth is, um, and, but, you know, in a way that's going to be constructive for everybody involved. And, and as the, the folks on our next webinar will discuss, um, they've seen actually great success uh, since they've uh, passed that, that ordinance. Uh, in addition to all these kind of traditional players, even the Department of Education has gotten in on the action talking about criminalization of homelessness. Uh, in their guidance, they put out under uh, the McKinney-Vento Act's uh, um, prohibition on uh, uh, keeping homeless students out of school. Um, they note that communities are required to address barriers to uh, homeless students getting into school, not just within the school itself, but also outside of the school walls, the, bar the barriers such as criminalization um, that may make it difficult for a homeless student uh, or their family to find a place to sleep at night that might force them to stay up all night or that might put them in jail so they couldn't even physically make it to school. These are barriers to the learning and education experience of homeless students. And so the Department of Education wanted to make sure that even school uh, school personnel or state education personnel were voicing their opinions against these kinds of policies uh, in their communities. <clears throat> and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, of course, we have the DDJI itself, um, which is another step by the federal government that's trying to bring people together to, uh, to fight these kinds of ordinances. <clears throat> So that's kind of the, the discussion of the legal and policy piece. Um, moving on to the financial implications of criminalization, we know that these laws are expensive and, you know, pointless. Uh, they don't get people off the streets permanently. They, in fact, put further barriers in the way of it. And um, the, the cost studies that have been done over the past few years have proven time and time again that uh, criminalizing homelessness uh, costs anywhere from two to three times uh, the amount that it simply would cost to, to provide housing. Um, again, we see uh, a study from Florida where county is spending um, mil literally millions of dollars for arresting a very small number of individuals, um, housing them uh, in either jail or in hospital rooms costs over $30,000 a year whereas it would only cost about $10,000 a year to provide uh, even supportive housing for those individuals, or a 68% reduction. <clears throat> Moreover, we see, um, as Tracia mentioned, uh, the increase of sweeps of homeless encampments um, uh, without providing alternatives. And uh, we know, for example, in Honolulu, they're spending an average of $15,000 a week to sweep away those camps. But those, uh, the people who are being swept literally move right around the corner and then come back a few days later to the encampments where they were. So that $15,000 is being spent uh, with no visible gain either for the homeless individuals or for the community at large, leading to kind of this uh, malaise feeling where communities say there's nothing that can be done um, but it, it's simply not true. It's that the, these solutions are spending money on, on solutions that don't work, um, but there are solutions that do work. Um, so people shouldn't be discouraged, but in, these kinds of policies do lend themselves to that, uh, that uh, fear. Uh, in terms of the efficacy for individuals, we know that um, every time a person is arrested, it leads to collateral consequences. Um, the person is put in jail, they can't pay their fine, uh, or first, first the person is given a ticket, maybe it's not even a, an arrestable offense, but if they can't pay the fine, then they are brought into jail. Um, they, if they're brought into jail, they can't pay their bail, um, because, or they don't have an address where they can give, so rather than being let out on bail, they're kept in jail for weeks or even months at a time. Um, often forcing them to accept a plea deal to get out, um, and then uh, they have a criminal record. Um, often, even if they are let out, tried to eligible for probation, 
they can't be let out on probation because homeless persons don't have a permanent address um, and they don't have any money to pay the court fines or fees. Uh, so that leads them to uh, staying in jail for longer, stay, getting back into jail um, and losing any employment that they might, might have. Homeless people, uh, about 40% of homeless people are working in any given month and if they're picked up on a charge of just trying to sleep at night, then they can't get to their job the next day, they lose their job, and you know that person is one step further away from getting out of homelessness. Um, and then they can't get another job because now they have a criminal record. Um, so for so many reasons, uh, criminalization laws don't work uh, to help get individuals off the streets um, in the communities. And as I said before, uh, it creates the illusion of doing something um, but uh, but it's not working, so it lends to this uh, fear that homelessness is unsolvable, and then that can reduce motivation uh, to pursue real solutions. Um, it costs the communities, it takes those resources that could be spent on providing housing, like that $15,000 a week that Honolulu is spending on sweeping encampments, and instead they could be housing uh, dozens of families with that money, um, and ending both their homelessness and the, the visible problems that they're trying to prevent in, in preserving their, their tourist industry. But luckily, uh, there are some steps that can happen um, that can improve this. Uh, local governments can cease enforcement of these laws immediately and then repeal them and stop enacting them in the future. There are efforts for homeless bills of rights uh, at the state level and at the local level that can help to take these kinds of approaches off the books and promote uh, better uh, discussions of what the real solutions might be uh, in the community. Um, and we need everybody to continue advocating with the federal government to increase housing assistance and create more incentives like uh, the Department of Justice brief or the, the HUD funding incentives uh, to decriminalize homelessness. And in communities across the country, there are lots of model programs out there. You'll hear more about them from people implementing them on the next webinar. Um, but everything from local taxes, funding housing trust funds, to housing first initiatives, uh, to better policing and respite care facilities for homeless people exiting hospitals, these models do exist and they are working all across the country. Uh, what else can be done? Well, we are at the National Law Center are partnering with over 100 groups across the country uh, to launch our Housing Not Handcuffs campaign in just two weeks. Um, and you as individuals or as cities um, or as uh, government agencies can endorse the campaign. Um, the, our website uh, at the bottom is not yet up but should be uh, in the next week or so. Um, but you'll be able to get more information there, but we would definitely love to get as many endorsements on uh, the campaign as we can before we formally launch on the 15th, um, and then, of course, thereafter. And, and in particular, endorsements from government officials, uh, from businesses, from law enforcement are particularly important to us uh, to be able to say, you know, everybody needs to be part of this, uh, the solution to this issue. Additionally, um, as I said, we will be hosting another webinar um, on Thursday, December 1st from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern, 10 to 11 Pacific, and we already have confirmed presenters from the National League of Cities, uh, from uh, San Francisco, California, where they have created a new navigation center um, that's uh, getting a lot of homeless people off the streets, um, from Charleston, South Carolina, where they were able to take an encampment of over 100 people and um, uh, dismantle it over time uh, by providing those individuals with housing and really following the U.S. Interagency Council guidelines um, and, and creating some fantastic best practices there. Uh, from Indianapolis, Indiana, where, as I said, they put that guidance into law. And from Syracuse, New York, uh, where they have uh, ended veterans' homelessness and are well on their way to ending chronic homelessness there. Um, and our, uh, their downtown business association actually gave the city and its agencies an award for um, helping to uh, reduce 
uh, homelessness there. So even the business community is seeing that, you know, rather than simply asking police to sweep people off the streets, that the, the long-term outreach approach and providing housing has served them better uh, in, in addition to the entire community. Um, we'll have some additional presenters who aren't yet confirmed as well, um, but it should be a really excellent opportunity to hear about uh, some of the solutions that are working. So uh, before we go to questions and answers, um, I wanted to do a couple more uh, quick polls. First, um, was the, uh, today's webinar helpful for you? Will you learn, uh, will you be able to use what you've learned here? All right, a couple more seconds. Great. And it looks like the vast majority of people uh, agree that this was a useful webinar, which is good reinforcement for us. Um, but the, the next question is, um, we do have some plans for our webinars uh, going forward into the future, um, but we'd like to hear from you about what kinds of things would be uh, m most useful to you in the work that you're doing. Um, if you want to pick more than one, um, obviously all of these options are, are great things. Um, you can also in the chat box indicate um, you know, any second or third choices or just say all of the above. Um, or if you have additional ideas beyond these ones, uh, feel free to uh, to enter those into the chat box as well, and we will try and make sure that we highlight them in future webinars. So I'll give people a couple more seconds with this. All right, great. And it looks like uh, cost studies are uh, uh, very high. Uh, in demand, um, thing to see more of and more examples of success and a little bit more on the federal policy. So we will definitely uh, hit on all of those in our future webinars. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, I will uh, go back and um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to be in contact with either Tristia or myself. Um, going forward. Uh, Tristia is located out on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. So, um, you know, you can try one or both of us um, depending on where you're at. Um, but we're, we're more than happy to, to speak with folks. We really appreciate people's time today. Uh, and as I said, there's um, lots of ways to get involved. We'll be sending out a email to everybody who attended today with um, some of the, the details on our campaign and on the upcoming webinars. And we definitely encourage people to, to share those uh, within their circles. And um, we'll be able to uh, take some good steps together to help uh, with the success of the Data-Driven Justice Initiative. Thanks, everybody. And um, we'll hopefully see you on December 1st for our next webinar.